Great. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, coming back for another Skillshare meeting. Today, we're going to do carceral feminism. That's my topic. And then Ignacio is going to uh, do a presentation on decision making, uh, which is going to be followed by Rita's presentation on accountability. I am very excited about all of these. I'm going to share my screen with you because I have made the um, slides this time. If I can figure it out, great. All right, carceral feminism. Um, I've been really excited about this topic lately because um, it's been coming up a lot in our work and it's been a, a phrase that I'm seeing actually coming up because a lot of people don't really identify as carceral feminists, particularly nobody really wants to be labeled like that. But um, it, the ways we talk about sexual violence prevention, especially CSA, but just like the way we talk about sexual violence uh, has a lot of tones in it that uh, kind of get mixed up with carceral feminism. So I thought it was good to just open this up and uh, understand more as to like how it shows up in our work. So what is carceral feminism? Carceral fem feminism is a term that was coined by Elizabeth uh, Bernstein, uh, who's a professor at uh, Barnard College, I believe. And it's uh, in the essay called The Sexual Politics of the Neo Ab uh, Abolitionism. Uh, it is uh, defined as roughly advocating for policing, prosecution, borders, and imprisonment as the primary solution to gender-based violence. So uh, gender-based violence, I'm using that term to kind of mean the larger uh, understanding of violence that is include like sexual violence, domestic violence, uh, you know, any kind of violence that is mostly in this framework targeted towards women. Um, but the definition itself is just a focus on, you know, all of these things are institutions, policing, prosecution, borders, and imprisonment, institutions that are kind of state solutions to violence. And they require this like governing body to organize, hire people, and go into communities to actually uh, implement these laws around uh, who is a harm doer, a perpetrator, and how sexual violence can be stopped. So that's kind of like the larger framework of like how carceral feminism is understood as. But what are the problems with carceral feminism? So first of all, is that the, a lot of people who are, you know, carceral feminism uh, uh, completely ignores the very fact that policing and the state itself and policing again, shows up in different ways. It's not just the police force. It is also like the prison guards. It is also ICE and border patrol. It is uh, all of those institutions that kind of watch over us and are hired by the state to do so is that they themselves are agents of violence and the kinds of violence that they perpetuate in our communities uh, are a part of the problem of why sexual violence happens in the first place. So then relying on these um, uh, institutions in order to address violence is a problematic. Uh, the other problem with carceral feminism is that prisons are sites of violence, right? And we, we run into this a lot in our work because uh, a lot of times when we talk about sexual harm doers, um, we kind of immediately go to this place of like, oh, let's put that person in prison. Um, they kind of consciously a lot of times with the understanding that prisons are sites of violence, especially sexual violence. So it's like wishing sexual violence onto uh, sexual harm doers as a form of punishment. Um, then the other problem is that gender-based violence perpetuates binarism and it erases violence against non-women. Um, so again, like this is, it's called carceral feminism, mostly because feminism for the most part has really focused on the liberation of cis women, right? And if by that, it really enforces that idea that men are perpetrators, women are victims. And so uh, when we put them in prisons, which is a sex segregated institution by itself, it just like gets really complicated as to, okay, how are we uh, would we still think for female harm doers, prison is the best place for them to go? How do we think about gender non-conforming and trans victims and harm doers who are get caught up in this system, which doesn't even recognize their humanity? So like all of these nuances of um, gender and sexual violence are erased or not talked about in carceral feminism. Uh, then the other problem is that the reality of economic and racial inequalities are not really talked about as a driving force of violence. What a lot of studies show that basically 
most people who, first of all, most sexual violence happens domestically. And, and the driving force of why a lot of survivors stay in domestic violence situations is because of economic um, inequality, which is tied with racial inequalities. And uh, this has been proven. There's a lot of studies around that. This is experiences of a lot of people. So very clearly, it's like if we just gave people more ways to take care of themselves besides relying on abusers and harm doers, we could immediately just like give a lot of folks, a lot of people a way out of their uh, really terrible living situations that are where abuse is happening. But uh, despite that, right, we're still focusing on how can we punish harm doers harsher? How can we put them more in prison? How can we call on the police uh, so that that may somehow actually address the, the problem of sexual violence? Another problem is that uh, state-based solutions are not accessible to uh, people who are already at risk of state violence. And that is basically all marginalized people, right? It's like if someone is a person of color, poor people, um, uh, you know, if someone is a person of color who's poor, who already is struggling and dealing with a lot of stigma around being like a single parent, uh, these are the least likely people to actually want to have state involved because they are the most impacted by the, viol the ongoing violence by the state to begin with. And when they get involved with the state, they really, in most cases, the harm is a lot more than any kind of um, remedy to their situation. Uh, and lastly, there, these are not the only problems, but lastly, uh, limiting scope of feminism to the individual and punitive approaches is kind of the take that carceral feminism is taking in this situation. So basically, instead of really thinking about sexual violence as what we talk about at the HEAL project as like the intersection of our collective failures uh, of systems that are systems of marginalization that are providing the context for violence to happen. Instead of focusing on how can we do collective liberation work, the focus is like, oh, well, the, here are a few, you know, really deranged individuals uh, who, if we just punish them harsher, if we just caught them earlier, if we just put them in prison for longer, then our problem will go away of sexual violence, uh, which is a very different type of approach to, um, to prevention, which is, it's not actually even prevention work, it's just after the facts. So then I thought it would be helpful to actually, with that background, go into some of the statistics as to uh, what's, what are some of the things that happened, carceral feminists have done, and what are the realities of this framework. So um, the, uh, yeah, the, the first one is that you may be familiar with the crime bill, the 1994 crime bill that, that is still was talked a lot about around Biden's, Biden's presidency because he was really for it, the Clinton administration for, was for it, and it was a driving force of uh, hiring a lot of <clears throat> police officers and policing a lot of communities of color and why a lot of Black people and Black men are today in prison or um, have a history of incarceration. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me. And for that bill, one of the things that actually really put some force behind that was the complaints that feminists were making to the police about how they ignore sexual violence. Now that's a very valid complaint because the police do ignore sexual violence and like they, treat, they don't really treat the reports of sexual violence too well. However, um, again, because this focus of this uh, and the history of that actually goes back to the 70s when it really started with the feminists, uh, carceral feminists really being raising the issue of like, why isn't police taking care of rapists? They need to be doing more. They need to be all of these like more um, laws and legislations around it. So the Violence Against Women Act was part of the crime bill that was passed in 1994. So that's, that's an, that was, I think, interesting. And then uh, another interesting fact is that right now in half of the states, they have mandatory arrest laws for every domestic violence call. So like if they get a domestic violence call and the police shows up, they have to go back with at least one person arrested for that call, which is really fucked up to begin with. But something else that I learned separately is that um, so for opposite sex couples, Oftentimes, the, ma the man is arrested, sometimes only the woman is arrested, and then in one person of the cases, both parties are arrested when the police is just like, we don't even know who's, who's doing what. But for same-sex couples, in 27% of the calls, of domestic violence calls, both of them get arrested. So again, thinking about how marginalized communities 
who are already experiencing violence at the hands of the state get more, they get harmed disproportionately. This is, I thought was a really great example of that. And, it, and considering that half of the states require these arrests, right? Another interesting fact was that 40% of police officers come from households with domestic violence compared to the 10% of general population. So I don't know what that exactly says, but that means that about one in two, two police officers who show up at a domestic violence call, they themselves are experiencing most likely with like unresolved trauma from their own childhoods and having come from a, a household that experienced domestic violence and how that impacts the situation. I think that would be really interesting. Another interesting fact is that the police punishes landlords where they get too many 911 calls from their tenants. So then in turn, landlords actually evict people who make too many 911 calls, which means in a lot of cases, victims who make a lot of calls uh, for even legitimate reasons, right? They, uh, they actually can be at risk of losing their housing. Um, then we have the, like we talked about it before, is that financial dependence and financial abuse is the dr driving force of why people stay in domestic violence situations and lack of policing is not really the issue. It's not that if we give people more ways to call the police or the police show up more at places or more people be like bystanders who call, somehow this issue is going to go away. Rather, we're seeing a, com a correlation between how well is someone doing, uh, in terms of their social economic safety in society, you know, having access to all sorts of uh, care and um, community care and how much they are at risk of uh, sexual violence and domestic violence. And lastly, as we know, black and brown harm doers are more likely to be arrested and charged and also they serve much, much longer sentences for the same crimes as white harm doers. Okay, and now a quick thing about, I thought it was really interesting about feminism and race, right? It's like, we've already heard kind of like the history of white feminism in the US started with very specifically white women who wanted liberation for themselves and like, their concerns weren't so much around how, um, you know, non-white, especially black uh, women were doing. And uh, that there was kind of a separation from the beginning but I thought a piece that was really interesting was how white feminists specifically actually used anti-sexual violence rhetoric to further marginalize black men and also perpetuate more of this stuff that was happening uh, with slavery and emancipation. So another specific piece of this that was interesting was that the narratives of this, this sexualization and race, racialization of sexual violence of black men against white women was something that was really used to justify things like lynching and also to scare the North from wanting uh, free black uh, people and free black men from migrating North. And that kind of, that's how the South kind of kept the North interested in maybe continuing this separation of like, where are black people now allowed to go? And where they can they, can they migrate? And this was kind of uh, really, uh, navigated or really monitored with this narrative of like, we don't want black people come here and raping our, our women, right? There's a lot of history around this, which is very fascinating, but I thought this was a interesting little point. Anyways, lastly, I'm sorry, check on time. How am I doing? I'm doing terribly. So <laughs> lastly, I'll cut this really quick in terms of how it shows up in our work. Uh, so uh, like I said, nobody's going to go around and say I'm a carceral feminist. Very few people would do so. However, uh, there are ways in which a lot of times people who are in sexual violence prevention, this can show up in their work. So one of them is that uh, anytime you see a lot of energy being directed towards more criminal justice system solutions and away from community solutions, you want to look at like, is there carceral feminism happening here. Another ways to look at it is when criminal justice is conflated with healing justice. When we think that, you know, the survivor needs, every survivor needs to see their harm doer go to jail and being like, have, they have to press charges, they have to take this person out of the society, and that's the way to, for healing. That narrative really perpetuates carceral feminism. We've talked a lot about making monsters out of sexual harm do doers because then that can really justify this idea of then harming the harm doer, right? Specifically, sexually harming the harm sexual harm doer has become this like new thing that is like let's that's cool. Let's just you know that's a justified thing to talk about. And I just want to make a 
quick note around that, I have personally no problem with people privately expressing a lot of anger and a lot of whatever they need to express against sexual harm doers. But I, I have a problem with that being taken with public rhetoric around this as institutions and organizations and people who are doing this work for liberation and for actual prevention of sexual violence. Like, proposing this as a solution is a problem, not so much a survivor or in a, in a, in a private group expressing anger and wanting, you know, whatever happened to a harm doer. And advocating for laws to criminalize various forms of sexual uh, harm, I think is one, this goes back to how, you know, conflating trafficking with sex work, how sexual expression and sexual education and liberation is all conflated with like, you know, it's grooming and it's, uh, we're just trying to like get sexualized people as if like sexualization, right, uh, is, is something that's inherently, we should just stay away from and it's inherently harmful. Um, so then we have uh, this whole idea that if we just have more laws and more legislation, then we will be free, that that's a problem, that's a solution. And lastly, the whole idea of fear mongering around race, class and immigration status and the idea of like, you know, the sexual violence happens because the other people are doing it. Really not focusing on the domestic issue and focusing on how can we close the borders? How can we not let people of color in our community? How can we police more people, or poor people? Because these are the people who are actually doing more of the sexual violence, which is a false narrative. And how can we resist it? I think I don't have much time, so I will leave this one up for later. I want to let more of you folks go, but uh, we talk a lot about this in the HEAL project and how uh, the work that we do are uh, alternatives to the ways that carceral feminists are participating um, in, 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 in the prevention work of sexual violence. Anyways, and I think the last one are resources, which is also, I put it up there for further reading for anyone who's interested. There it is. That was awesome. I love that. It, it, it uh, totally uh, made me think about this, this conversation that we often have about, uh, you know, laws or legislations that um, we've had and, you know, we're critiquing now. And, and, and I remember when that law changed when I was a kid, I remember when that happened, I had a family member who was being uh, abused uh, intensely. And um, at the time, every time the cops came, she was too afraid to say you know, anything. And so she wouldn't say anything. And so they would always leave. And so that, that became the push for that, right? So because they're afraid now it's mandatory, they just get arrested. So in that time, that was the thing that was, that was needed in that time, it is not, it's not the thing anymore, right? So it's like reevaluating these things that we've had for 20, 30 years and really need to shift that. Thank you. And I am doing the really sexy topic of decision making. <laughs> so sexy. Uh, <laughs> so um, <clears throat> decision making procedures. Uh, and it's, it's very short, but there were some things that came out of just um, doing a little research on this that were really um, not as surprising, but it really in alignment with how we talk about things at the Hill Project. So, um, and just thinking about what um, group decision-making refers to the process. Wait, I have to move this. Oh, motherfucker. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I can never move the thing and I can't see the freaking slide. Okay, there we go. Got it. Whew. All right. So, uh, group decision make uh, group decision making refers to the process where the group as a whole makes the decision. All right. And so, um, <clears throat> This seems like a pretty, you know, uh, simple thing to do. But when we're thinking about like projects and organizations, uh, definitely this becomes much more complex. Uh, when we think about many, many different people, uh, uh, the number of people and the ideas that are being put forth, also the structure in which um, everyone is trying to make this decision. Um, but we're focusing on group decision making because this is like something that we're. Um, we try. We haven't like made an official like how we make decisions, but we have made decisions in a way where we 
um, share, give opinions. We go around and then um, we pretty much for the most part have come to, you know, understandings like, yes, an agreement or a middle ground, right? But mostly an agreement, I would say. And so there's some positives and negatives about um, for decision making. <clears throat> And so the pros for group um, decision making are that they generate more ideas, they generate knowledge, and they generate more alternatives. So there's a lot more in abundance, uh, a lot more um, opportunities uh, uh, and ways to look at things. Right? Uh, but the cons are that it is very slow moving. Uh, oftentimes, there's lack of accountability uh, and um, too many opinions, and sometimes there's overpowering personalities. Um, in which um, those people often make their decisions and it's not really a group decision, right? And so um, here are, there were like so many ways that people make decisions, but I kind of take these out as like the ones that I kept seeing coming over and over. And then I'm gonna focus on two of them because um, these were the ones that I thought were really interesting. And so decision-making techniques are flop. Basically flop is like, uh, people brainstorm, they kind of generate these ideas, but nothing really happens. And uh, it's not really a big consequence because it just kind of fixes itself uh, because it, it wasn't really a big uh, decision making, make or break kind of a thing. So it's kind of this flop thing. So there's no real accountability. Things just kind of fall through the cracks, right? And then there's delegating to an expert. So if it's a really, really big decision, especially if it's a big company, sometimes they would want to bring somebody in who has this expertise. And really that sometimes just takes the pressure off of people for someone else to give that final say, right? Uh, then we have averaging, which is pretty much like finding a middle ground, right? So um, people give their opinions and, and then we come to a place where everyone can live with it, right? <clears throat> And we have voting. We all know what voting is. So people vote, majority rules. Uh, and then brainstorming. Uh, brainstorming where people just make lists of things and then from those brainstorms kind of develop bigger ideas until they come to um, something. Um, and then pros and cons and um, rank the possibilities. It's come almost like brainstorming. It's just like what's best and kind of figuring it out as a group. Um, so lots of ways where people um, either uh, pretend to make decisions as a group or actually make decisions as a group, but two that really stood out to me that I thought were interesting were groupthink and then, of course, uh, consensus. Um, so groupthink is the desire to avoid dissent from the group's position so as to maintain a consensus of the group or generally groupthink occurs when a very important decision is made in a stressful situation and when the stakes are potentially very high. So this is something that we talk about a lot at the Hill Project. One of the things that I've said that I do not want to do is I don't want, I really wanna try very hard as much as we can never to work from a place of, of uh, high anxiety, that there has to be a decision that has to be made right now because uh, life or death, or it is because our decision is the most important decision right now, right? Putting ourselves up like that. I can't function in, in those kind of ways. And so this uh, group think uh, thing is like, uh, it made me think of like these giant companies that sit around a boardroom where, you know, people are like, yes, like, yes, men. Yes, yes, yes. They agree with what somebody says. They don't want any problems. Um, and so this to me is like, it, it Maybe maybe I'm minimalizing it, but it it sounds it's very capitalist kind of model, right? It's a that kind of framework that we don't want to to be a part of. Like we want to be able to hear people's opinions and speak, you know, talk them out, and then nothing is ever that um, um, like time um, time sensitive that we would have to like absolutely make a decision that we were we wouldn't stand behind that we wouldn't stand behind right um <clears throat> and then uh consensus and consensus is usually the, the uh, probably the way that i have uh worked with tons of people to make decisions with it's the one that seems uh, you know kind of like the the best and so consensus is finding an established proposal that all members can support so uh, achieved when a group of individuals with a common goal agree to support activities necessary to achieve that goal, even if that agreement flies in the face of the wishes of individual members of the group. 
facilitated when leadership is strong. So this is another thing that came up around uh, leadership too. So consensus, you know, this, this idea that, um, you know, we can um, take the time to listen to everyone and continue to listen to people as we hash this out, right? And so I remember when uh, um, we started first talking about consensus, like about wow, 20 years ago, and how many, how people were, a lot of people were upset by it because it was like, it just takes too damn long, right? Because we were working in models of uh, like, you know, 15, 20, 30 people trying to do consensus with that many people. It was, a nightmare it was a nightmare but we did it right but and it took so long so that was one uh critique of it like it taking long but it, it really made me think as i kept reading uh around about consensus i was like this is like circle and so i was like and in the resources that i will provide one of the articles is the history of consensus and you know um, the consensus model and it is like you know pieces pieces of it if not a lot of it comes from you know indigenous circle so that's how circle works right it's like you know you you speak and you keep on speaking until there's a resolution right so that you know we don't stop until it continues on so it's rooted in um in you know poc and indigenous you know teachings and stuff and um and the way it says, like it says, is gen you did you discuss an issue, you generate a proposal, you discuss the concerns, and then if there's concerns, you repeat concerns, repeat concerns, repeat. Um, <clears throat> and so consensus seems to be the model that uh, kind of I think fits with us uh, most, or the one that I would you know propose. But the key to consensus, I think, is to stay small. So a lot of the things that I read was stay below seven. Um, seven or more is just uh, a bias kind of seeps into that. And then group thinking can be uh, an issue, right? Um, oh, and then also the size of the group also is connected to the wellness of the group as well. So the, I, I saw a lot of things talking about just wellness, mental health, and the, the bigger the group, the harder that becomes. Um, and so uh, keeping small, which keeps me going back to that, that idea that we're always talking about, about and, you know, how we uh, envision the future, about communities coming together, like um, um, little networks and stuff, you know, smaller, um, smaller groups supporting one another instead of like these big things where somebody's at the head making you know all these decisions that's just like a little ridiculous right um so i have this quote here we communicate information and information is used in making of decisions moreover group decision requires transmitting of messages between members and the effectiveness the effectiveness of this communication process will significantly impact the quality of group decisions so here we go back to talking about our um, you know our ability to commute i mean commute communicate properly right our ability to communicate properly um, and uh, a lot of the stuff that uh, came up around this was you know it goes back to like relationship building right so uh, and the leadership, right? There's also an article in the resource that I'm sharing. It talks about um, a good decision maker is a good leader, right? And so, um, and how to succeed in decision making is relationship building, your own personal internal work, self care, like how you take care of yourself, um, the vulnerability that you share, and also your communication skills. So all of the things that we talk about at the Hill Project that should be life skills for young people are the things that actually make people, you know, just really good decision makers and um, really good leaders as well. Um, and so uh, traits of a good leader, good leadership. So just wanted to show all of these things, again, connected to the life skills that we continue to go back to that supports and nestles like our you know sexuality our gender identities and how we navigate the world so traits of good leadership self-motivation humility integrity innovation honesty active listening so there's so so many good things that come you know out of that and then the one that comes up a lot is emotional intelligence and we also talk about emotional intelligence a lot and the ability to understand and manage your emotions and those of others is one of the most important qualities a leader must possess the, the ability to understand and manage your emotions and those of others is one of the most important qualities a leader must possess and i, I read that over and over because i think <clears throat> i started thinking a little bit about like um is this 
in some instances, I was like, is this a little ableist? Is this ableist, right? Because I keep on thinking about emotional intelligence and I want to like add to that definition in some ways, because I think when I've talked about it before, it almost feels like I don't want to, I don't want to talk about it as you know, like I am so much smarter than you because I have this intelligence, right? Like it's a more so an ability that we all have to work on, right? This ability that we all have to work on, and it's named emotional intelligence, but this ability to understand and manage. I always say that I'm always working on understanding and managing, right? Um, my emotions. So kind of reframing that. Um, and a leader's mood, which I like this too, it's a mood and not the mental health or anything. A leader's mood will resonate with others and set the tone for the emotional climate in an organization. I like that language there because that has nothing to do with somebody's mental health. It has to do with like the energy and the vibration and the positivity or how you, you know, put out information to, to your people, right? Um, and it is, um, oh, when I was like the, for a great leader, I said it was the emotional intelligence, the ability to handle uncertainty and the ability to weigh evidence with intuition. Um, <clears throat> and then it's about, of course, relationship building. Um, we can't forget the relationship building piece because that is everything. This is why we do the, like, the Skillshare. This is why we work at the, mo the models that we try to do at the Heal Project. Um, we want to do the relationship building, which is providing a safer space uh, for folks to speak as well, uh, which focuses on feedback of decisions or strategies and not individuals, express comments as suggestions, um, and express feedback with empathy and appreciation for persons uh, work towards the joint goal. Uh, and then about uh, it's about uh, Sorry, uh, collective responsibility. So that was a safety one. Uh, uh, collective responsibility. So uh, this one uh, means holding the whole group responsible for the actions of individuals or individual groups within the group or individual groups within the group. Collective responsibility asserts that there is no individual action for which the group cannot in some way be held accountable. Acknowledgement of collective responsibility is often made in response to deep rooted social problems that cannot be addressed by targeting individuals or a single group. So this was interesting because um, I kept reading more stuff about the collective responsibility also known as collective guilt is a concept in which individuals are responsible for others actions by tolerating, ignoring or harboring them without actively collaborating on these actions. So when I first looked it up, I was like, collective responsibility seemed like this good thing. And then it was like, no, it's not because it works against, um, it works against um, the, the, I think the, the speaking up and it, it, it feeds into the group think as well. And so I started thinking about what's the difference between responsibility versus accountability when we're thinking about, you know, working in organizations. And so, um, oh yeah. And so that's where I wanted to kind of bleed into the accountability piece because um, to me, um, when we're thinking about decision-making, um, Yes, that sometimes people take responsibility for these decisions, but the hierarchy doesn't allow for uh, any kind of um, feedback, correction, or any kind of discussion for it. But if we have a, a model of this accountability, it, it changes that, right? Because then we understand we have information about everything that's going on. Uh, we can we this it's uh, the processes that we can question it and in 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 uh, and interact with it. It's a different, it's a different process than having the collective responsibility or the hierarchical responsibility um, and shifting that to this uh, group decision-making process that works for us, whether that's consensus or not, but that's rooted in accountability. That to me is also rooted in our respect for one another and the idea of growth and deeper relationship building. I am done. Okay, I will stop sharing. Thank you, Ignacio. I Is it showing up anymore? It's at the bottom now, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Now it's okay, yeah. cool. All right. Awesome. Um, so, all right. So accountability is not lying or denial about harm that you have caused. And it is not scary because it should be seen as an opportunity for growth rather than 
a punishment, which it also is not, because as we know, punishment is not an effective means of changing behavior, it just increases fear. And usually when people are punished, they just do the thing just in a way that they won't get caught another time. So I wanted to say what accountability is. So it is a long-term process. It's not something that can just happen overnight. It can take months to years and being a part of an accountability process is being committed to spending that time on yourself and on others. Also, it's hard because you have to be vulnerable and delve into topics that people are usually averse to talking about because they're heavy, like shame, regret, grief, trauma. And so it is also showing up. So showing up when you've done the harm and I think the important part of showing up is showing up in a space where you are able to be accountable when you've healed from all the shame and other trauma that you have because if you have a lot of shame then you're not going to be able to be 100% um, present with your like accountability and it has to do with like a commitment to those around you for example choosing to stay in a relationship when you know that everyone harms it's a way to respect each other's dignity and humanity while acknowledging we all make mistakes. And accountability is making sure that behavior that you did doesn't happen again. And the first step is understanding you are responsible for your choices and the consequences of those choices. Once you realize that, it's very much sitting with the uncomfortable feelings you have and figuring out where that behavior really comes from. And then it's making a commitment towards change, a plan to shift your life away from the patterns that cause you to harm. And then lastly, it's repairing, right? So it is either an apology or making amends. And I think an important part of repairing um, is understanding that your actions are not individual, but collective. Meaning that not only did the person you harm get hurt, but their community was directly and indirectly impacted as well. And then another part of accountability is holding yourself. It's looking inwards. It's figuring out when you do cause harm, what actions went against your core beliefs. It's figuring out the impact of the harm that you did. It's doing healing work. It's doing trauma work. It's working basically towards the person you want to be in this world. And lastly, it takes time and you might fuck up a couple of times and that's okay. It's just making sure that you get back up and try again. So this is a very simplified steps of accountability, but um, because it's very nuanced and very complex, but like first it's like I said, acknowledging the behavior. So moving past denial and excuses and blaming and really admitting to yourself and others that you caused the harm. Then it's dissecting the behavior, understanding why the behavior happened, where it comes from, what needs were not being met which cause you to do this. Then it's adjusting the harmful attitudes, which is making a plan to change the behaviors that cause you to do harm. And that can be in any module of like, it could be like therapy, it could be trauma work, it could be ha like building a community because you don't have that support. Um, and then it's making repairs, which is apologizing or making amends. And then by doing all of those things, you can become a more healthy community member. So there are a lot of obstacles to accountability, which I'm sure you all know. Um, so one of the big obstacles is fear, right? So fear of losing community and loved ones, if you admit to doing this harm, it is being scared of change and what will come from that change because scare, change can be really scary. And it's also fear of causing harm to your ego because everyone, because of like a lot of individualism and that type of thing, they want to protect themselves and their ego and accountability makes you take off those layers. Um, and also it's fear of rejection because you don't, no one is going to want to try to be accountable if they're just gonna be rejected from everyone. So that you kind of have to make it worth it for someone to admit that they harm. And also people are scared of accountability itself. Like I said, it's seen as a threat when it should really be seen as an opportunity for growth. There's also a lot of assumptions around accountability. So the first assumption is that people who harm are bad and have a moral flaw and that's it. Like 
there's nothing we can do about it. And we're just going to end it there. It's also assuming that we're outside of harm because we are on the right side of justice, like a holier than thou mentality, because like you can do no wrong because you're always right or you're like you're woke or you do something that's like good so you can't do harm. And then it's also assuming that there's a right and wrong, which it's like there is so much gray area in between and it's complex and it's nuanced and it's not just two things. It also has to do with punishment norms. So like vengeance is when a person who harmed needs to be harmed, like an eye for an eye mentality, right? And these punishment norms are learned from childhood. When you do something wrong, you're punished. And it also has to do with blame mentality. The fact that like people feel like they need to have like a person to blame so that that person can be hurt somehow, which goes into incarceration, which is assuming that people who do wrong need to be put in prison and punished instead of trying to get to the root of why they caused harm and making it not happen again. Because just punishing someone will just, the behavior will happen again because they're not getting anything out of the behavior not happening again, if that makes sense. And then another huge obstacle is white supremacy. So individualism, like, especially like in the like United States and stuff, we live in a very individualist society and like you care about yourself and you put yourself first. And accountability requires listening and putting your ego aside and caring about the collective. And that's not something people are good at, like really want to do a lot of the time. Um, and people avoid conflict because it's seen as negative. So they don't wanna admit that they've done something wrong, which goes into like the right and wrong. And it also has to do with distancing from harm doers, right? Like when someone does harm, automatically we're just like, we don't like this person, they're done. And it's like a huge part of it is that we haven't been socialized to be accountable. So we don't understand that we can make someone be accountable without just like completely like canceling them. And then it also has to do with shame. Um, shame could be like a whole presentation on its own so what i'm gonna say about it for now is that like healing from shame has to be a prerequisite to be present with accountability so another part of accountability is supporting harm doers so paying attention to intention right so figuring out the root causes and figuring this out to create conditions around which accountability will be possible is processing the trauma so that you can be accountable. And pat like patterns of lashing out can be rooted in like not being held and not being loved. And so if you're not held and loved and your needs aren't being met, you don't really feel like a human being and aren't able to actually think about the impact of your actions. And it's about barriers of access, like if like making sure people have their basic need met. Like if they don't have shelter, they're not gonna give a fuck about an accountability process. They're gonna care about where they're gonna sleep at night. So making sure that they have those things. It's also having a support system with like deep love and commitment, like people who really believe that you can transform. And also it's meeting regularly with the harm doers. It is also reframing accountability, saying that it is doable and in reality, it can be liberating because working through your shame can help you have a new level of understanding about yourself. Also, it's being non judgmental, right? Like not yelling, not screaming, not blaming. It's really trying to understand why the behavior happened. And then also understanding it takes time for people to process the impact they made, to evolve their sense of self and also to learn. What I mean by this is with a lot of the teaching that I've done, like scaffolding is a huge thing where you take little things and make it into a bigger concept, right? So shifting the way we interact in smaller issues because the smaller issues shape how we relate and those skills can be transferred slowly to larger issues. And also realizing that everybody harms. And so we, 
or we should try to build relationships with people we can trust to be accountable that are vulnerable and that really understand and focus on fears and shame and guilt. And it's like really setting a norm around accountability and what it means to be human. So now I'm gonna talk about accountability in the workplace, which is more relevant. Let me see how I'm doing on time. Okay, maybe I will continue accountability in the workplace next time. So that was just the definition of accountability because we only have 10 more minutes. Thank you, Rodel. <laughs> I was, was like, that that's a good it? spot to end though. For, yeah, uh, it ended up working out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. I, as you were, uh, I actually realized how both of your topics kind of like go into the carceral feminism and really actually tie in beautifully, right? It's like yeah. carceral feminism is when we don't want to think about the skills that we need around accountability and decision making. Right. Right. Um, right? It's like this band aid solution that isn't really working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking too about like um, accountability in the sense too, like um, as a as a way of being too, like not only as um, this uh, process, right, but also an existence of like how we exist in community with each other and account and like within accountability, meaning um, that there, there's a level of like at least like care or wanting to care. Yeah. <laughs> you put this work in and that you that you want to listen to boundaries and you want to understand where people are at so that you understand where you are are in relation to that person so you're stepping into it with the with a better understanding rather than um fucking up and then having to be accountable right so we're taking it a couple of steps back and saying let's start with actually knowing all our stuff. like let's get to know one another let's get to know all of this stuff and then uh, start from there, you know. Yeah, and, and I think something that uh, I'd like whether you mentioning is um, like all the prerequisites to actually show up for accountability, right? And it's like I've always thought about how when harm happens, the first thing that really, uh, in it's my, what I've experienced is like trust is the, the most, trust goes the way, right? Especially when it's just me and one other person. Uh, when I experience harm from them, I no longer trust them. So I know, and, and when that, that's broken, I no longer want to, I don't trust their accountability process. I don't trust to be even around them. I don't care about what they have to say. So um, you know, a lot of times in that, that's exactly where I need community to show up for me because um, I don't think it should be my uh, responsibility to like have to go through accountability process with a harm doer um by myself when I don't trust that person <laughs> anymore and likewise right it's like I totally understand when somebody on, I've harmed doesn't want to sit through accountability with me um we need a third party here we need we need help from our community you're both muted yeah, yeah one that, of I'm just going to say that is that is exactly it the, the the relationship and community piece like that is it <laughs> um we think that we can bypass that, um, that, that um, this is why, this is why um, uh, police don't work when it comes to like sexual violence and stuff, you know, like it, they're not, they don't understand that they're, they're not, they're not prepared. They're not, they're, it's just, they have a, a, a certain kind of tactic trying to deal with this and it's not the right tactic. It doesn't fit. It's not the right puzzle piece. It just doesn't work. Mm. Right. Yeah. I wanted to go back to you, Ignacio's presentation about decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was really interesting. Well, one thing that stood out to me is how I've been really thinking about like different approaches to decision making for different types of situations and different decisions. Yeah. And, different, so, and um, because actually we're talking about consensus, it reminded me a lot. I, I used to live in uh, cooperative housing a lot and you know there will be like anywhere from 
over seven, so like eight to nine to 15 people in a room mm -hmm. trying to make the decisions. It was consensus-based decision-making for a lot of important decisions that would impact our you know, household and livelihoods. Um, and um, I think actually we had a thing like consensus minus one or consensus minus two. So mm -hmm. it was like, if one or two people disagreed in the group with a decision, we would still go forward with that. Right, so, so there's like a lot of really interesting like nuances in that too, but it reminded me of how actually I felt very much a lot of the times like not as someone who was like more of a marginalized person in that group as well. Um, a lot of times I felt like the, the whole group thing would show up, um, you know, and, and the realities of like, we only have like this amount of time for this like bi-weekly meeting we're doing and we just want to get out of here. And mm -hmm. so why should we spend time to actually like hear these ideas that are new, right? It's like, and like the dynamic between old members and new members, people who feel like more entitled to these decisions versus others. Mm -hmm. and, and again, not that those are all wrong, but I, I've been really thinking about a way of doing decision-making that is more customized, right? So like maybe some decisions do depend on like who's assuming what role, who has more experience in what, do we want to give them more of a decision-making power specific to that decision? Yeah, right? I was doing the same thing because it was like, again, it's like you can't use a cookie cutter model for every decision, mm -hmm. right? Just the same way that some people could use brainstorming to generate some stuff. You're not gonna use brainstorming for like this, like really important decision that you're going to make, right? Like, cause you're gonna use a different framework. So yeah, I think I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and then at the core of it again, goes back to trust. Yeah, it's like, exactly. You can't you can, you can end up feeling good about a decision in a group that you don't trust its processes and its people and the members, right? Yeah. Yeah, later in my presentation, I was going to talk about trust and how like a lot of the time, like without accountability or without like an actual decision making process, like the trust is just destroyed because mm -hmm. people don't think that they can come and say like this happened, that's wrong, or this is my opinion or something like that, because they just don't trust the people around them. And that just like dissolves a lot of the ideas and like cool things people could be doing because they just don't trust and like people don't try to build that trust a lot of the time yeah 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 absolutely it really goes back to that um i i also i wanted to call out the the white supremacy culture around accountability and how it like actively promotes lack of accountability um and just plug this new tv hbo tv show which I haven't watched yet. It's on my watching list, but I want to put it out there. It's called Exterminate All the Brutes. Have you heard of this? Mm -mm. No. So no. have you seen uh, I Am Your Negro? No, but I have it on my- uh... oh, I am not your Negro, I forgot. Yeah, the, I, I, um, uh, the, the, same, the director of the same thing has made this TV show, which goes into the history of white supremacy and how basically that the roots of that continue to like deeply embed into our cultural norms, the way we interact, the way we think about everything around us, right? It's like the dominant way of thinking about society and uh, relationships and all of that are impacted by these ideas of violence and colonization. And, um, and, and, and which again, to me, immediately goes back to like the whole idea of like, not only the history of where police and prison and incarceration comes from and how intertwined that is with white supremacy, but like the replacement of having trust and accountability uh, with that. So people don't wanna show up in their communities. They just wanna call 911. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Quick fix, it's quick fix. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like with like violence, especially, like it's not something like you're even taught. It's like if someone does something wrong, they're going to get punished somehow. And yeah. I just feel like it's like something that like I personally had to learn <laughs> through other people because I didn't even think at one point it was a possibility. I was like, oh, this bad thing happened. This person goes to jail. That's it, you yeah. know? but there's like so much more nuance to it and like, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, this all fit together nicely, see? Yeah. Right. <laughs>
Oh, 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 oh,